If you would all stand and turn to our text for this morning, Psalm 100, as we read that. Psalm 100. And starting in verse 1. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures, and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's pray. Father, we just ask that you would allow us for this moment, Lord, to just kind of turn off everything in the world. Lord, the distractions that are going on in our lives and in this crazy world that we live in. Lord, let that just be pushed aside for uh, this moment in time that we might gather all of our thoughts and all of our heart and our mind and spirit all to this one place, Lord, and that we might read your word and understand your word. Father, we, we ask that you would do a work in us this morning, each one of us, so that we leave here changed men and women. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So, we are nearing the end of uh, this particular psalm. We are going to look specifically at verse 4 this morning. Uh, this will be called the Prelude to Worship, part 3. And I have had the privilege uh, and the honor on multiple occasions, uh, much like Casey, uh, to meet a number of famous musicians that this world would know. Uh, some big names. Uh, I was in some cases uh, taken backstage, brought into the present, and brought into their presence, and introduced to them. It was a very humbling uh, experience, very exciting at the same time. Uh, but at the same time, I've also met some great and well-known pastors and writers. Again, very humbling that these giants for the faith let me be in their presence for just a little while. What and, and it was just an honor, and it was a privilege. From an earthly perspective, we, we, we give no great weight to these men, but as we look at them for maybe some of their accomplishments and what they, what they have done, uh, it was just honoring to be there with them. I've walked through the doors of many what some may call sacred places, uh, St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh where John Knox preached. St. Magnus's Cathedral in Kirkwall, Orkney Islands, St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin, the London Metropolitan Tabernacle in London where Charles Spurgeon preached. Uh, very humbling places uh, when you stop and think about the history of these churches, some of them six, seven hundred years old. Places where you would go and you experience a great reverence as you enter in those doors. The grand architecture uh, meant to point to the, to the majesty and the awe of God. Now, those were some, like I said, earthly, worldly kinds of illustrations. And some of you may have uh, some of your own that you could tell us about. Times you've had the privilege to be in the honor of, the, uh, the, you have been honored to be in the presence of some important people. Or maybe be in some very important and reverent places. But if we want to look at this in a little bit different light, let's look at it in a biblical perspective with a biblical illustration. Let's think for just a moment about the tabernacle or the temple. Uh, and, and this is going to be kind of brief, uh, but we take the temple, for instance. Uh, just the beauty, I mean, from what the, from what the historians have said, the, the temple of Solomon was just absolutely phenomenal. 
It was unbelievable to see. This outside part where the court of the Gentiles was, uh, then you have this area where it was the court of the women where only Jews, ritually clean Jews could come into. Then there was the priest court where the offerings were made and the sacrifices. And, and then you come into uh, this place in the temple, this holy place where the golden candlestick was and the table of showbread and the altar of incense. And then we get to that inner portion, the, the holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. And there was only one person who could go in there and that was only once a year. It was the high priest as he brought the blood of the, of the sacrifice there to pour out on the horns or pour out there on the mercy seat. This was the place to worship. See, God's presence was in this place. It was a sacred place, uh, that special part. One part, particularly, that, that Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. It was like no other place on earth. Now, I want you, I want you to put yourself there in the, at the temple on the day that it was inaugurated. Turn, if you will, back over to uh, 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles and chapter 5. And I want us to see the, the splendor of what takes place here. 2 Chronicles chapter 5 and verses 13 and 14. The ark is being brought into the temple. The temple is, is being dedicated on this day. And in, and in verses 13 and 14, this is what it says. And it was the duty of the trumpeters and singers to make themselves heard in unison and praise and thanksgiving. Remember that, praise and thanksgiving, because we're going to look at that, to the Lord. And when the song was raised with trumpets and cymbals and other musical instruments, in praise to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever, the house... The house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. You see what I'm saying about this? This isn't like any other place on earth. The presence of God is coming here into the temple. It's going to be over that mercy seat there on the top of the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. So these people came through those gates and into those courts, but they couldn't go any further. They made it just that far. And it says, again, it was filled with a cloud. But let's not just, you know, just stop there. Let's look over in chapter 7 of First Chronicles and verses 1 through 3. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. When all the people saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. This is a worship service here. The presence of God is in this place. And we know throughout the course of the history of the Jewish people, that presence of the Lord would depart from that place one day and not return. But let's look a little bit further. Turn over to Ezra, a couple, couple books further. The book of Ezra. In chapter 3, the temple had been destroyed. It's been, it's, it's been rebuilt. Chapter 3, verses 11 and 13. <clears throat> Verse 11. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. Sound familiar? Because that's what happened the first time. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. Though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout. And the sound was heard far away. 
Now stop and think about this place. Put yourself there on the Day of Atonement. When that, when that one day when the priest would enter in and put the blood on the mercy seat, atoning for the, for the sins of Israel. Think about the Passover. Think about any of those feast days early on in the life of Israel, and you would have experienced such worship as never before. They were privileged. They were honored to be God's chosen people before the foundations of the world. They were invited to that place to come through those gates and into those courts by God himself. And they were called there for the purpose of worshiping the living God. Now things haven't changed. There, now things have changed a little bit. They, they haven't changed as far as worship is concerned though. But some things have changed. See, there is no one temple that we are called to worship at. No more priests to make sacrifices. No more are we to bring lambs and goats and bulls for sacrifices. No more are there these high feast days that we have to observe. But we are called to gather in worship. To, jo to, to gather joyfully in worship, to make a joyful noise to the Lord, to sing joyfully, to serve joyfully in the worship of the one true triune God, the one true creator, the one true shepherd that this world will ever know. Today our text is going to show us three different things. The privileged people, the privileged people, the perfect place, the perfect place, and the great purpose, the great purpose. <clears throat> Starting with the privileged people. Now we need to very briefly, I want us to go back to verse 3 and, and, and read that over again. We need to go back there as we begin because we need to restate who we are, who the Jews were. Now know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We belong to the Lord. We are his completely. Every man, woman, child who has come to trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, repented of your sins and asked for forgiveness, you belong to him. He saved you. And it wasn't because you were any cuter or any smarter or any stronger or any more righteous than all the other people on the face of this earth. No, it's not because of that. It was his divine sovereignty and election that saved you. He did it. Well, because he did. I can't answer that any, any better than that. He saves us because he could. He did it. He saved you. He made you his own. Now, as we look at some of these, these verses that are on here, I want that to ring out in your head. You belong to him. You're not your own. You are his. Psalm 79, verse 13. But we, your people, they're identifying that we're yours. But we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, pasture, will give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. Psalm 95, verse 7. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. We belong to him. Isaiah 43, one and, uh, verse 1 and verse 7. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name. You are mine. Verse 7, everyone who, who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 30 and uh, 31, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God with them. 
and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord God. And you are my sheep, human sheep of my pasture, and I am your God, declares the Lord. Is it sinking in? You seeing where that, that part is that we are a privileged people? We're a people who have been honored to be called by God's name. But wait, listen to what it says in John. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right. Wow. We have the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John chapter 10, this great passage where Jesus identifies that we're his. Chapter 10 of John, verses 3 and 4. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. And I have other sheep. Praise God. I'm one of those other ones. You and I are one of those other ones. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. Chapter 14, verses 7 and 8, For none of us lives to Himself, and none of us dies to Himself. If for if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. 1 Corinthians 6.19 Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit uh, within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. We belong to somebody else. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Is it clicking? Are you seeing this pattern here? As I've said before, we are not orphans. We are not outcasts. We are not homeless without family. We're not strays that just wander around. We belong to the Lord of all creation. We are His family. Think of the titles as the children of God. There's one of those titles. Think of the titles that we have been given. We are the beloved of God, the ransomed of the Lord, vessels of honor, sons of God, children of the kingdom, chosen vessels, heirs of the promise, kings and priests, the faithful, lights of the world, friends of Jesus, the elect of God. See, we are privileged and honored to be His. And listen, just so your heads and my head doesn't get all puffed up. Listen to the words of the Lord given to his chosen people, the Jews, in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verses 6 through 8. Listen to what he says to them. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than, other, than any other people at the that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers, that the Lord has brought you with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh the king of Egypt. That will keep us humble there. It's not anything to do with you and your smarts and your good looks and your, your good qualities. 
This was all decided before the foundations of the world were ever laid. Because God chose them, they became privileged and honored above all men on the face of this earth. Do you see that? They were special. They were set apart from all others. They were distinct. Now we too can lay claim to that special title of the people of God. All of those of us who are in Christ. Now turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 1. Listen to what it says about us. Blessed be, in verses 3, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Chapter, uh, verse 7. Him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, have upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. That's us. Verse 11 and 12. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. We're privileged people. As we sit here this morning together, you got something that nobody else around may have. Do you understand that? You carry an honor that many others do not carry this morning. You are the children of the living God. But it, all, but it wasn't always like that, now was it? See, because if we look down a little bit further in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers of the covenant of covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. Titus 3, 3 says, We ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, let us stray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. And it was because of what Jesus did that we became privileged and honored men and women. What Jesus did in living a perfect life according to the letter of the law and shedding his blood on Calvary's cross for our sins and dying and rising again on the third day, all to make us his, no one else's. We are the privileged, the honored, the distinct, the highly respected by God out of all those on the face of this earth. Our, and, and I would just say, oh, Christian, let that sink in. You are different from everyone else. You are different. I want you to let that marinate upon your heart and your soul. Then I want you to meditate on it deeply for the rest of your days. But there is something different about you because of Christ. You have become a privileged an honored member of his family. Now, now, let me ask you this. Knowing who you are, knowing who you belong to, should that forever alter how you worship? We of all people, those of us sitting in this room this morning that claim Christ as our Savior, that belong to him, we of all people should be worshiping in a way that every neighborhood, every county, every state, Every nation knows who we are, the people of the living God. Our worship as God's chosen vessels should drown out the shouts of the Muslim when they cry out, there is no God but Allah, but Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. We should drown them out. Our worship as the beloved of God 
should silence the monotone chanting of the Buddhists. Our worship as the kings and priests of God should be the death knell of the pagans' rituals and songs. Our worship as the heirs of the promise should rattle Beelzebub's castle and make the gates of hell tremble. Because we belong to him. We're his. He has ownership of us. We are the sons and daughters of the living God. Our worship requires more of us. It demands more of us. We of all people should be worshiping like no other does. Because he is owed it. He deserves it. He is worthy of it because he has saved us for himself, because he is most glorified in our passionate and pleasurable worship of him. And that is why we should make a joyful noise. Come singing, come into his presence, come his sheep, come as his, come serving gladly. And you alone are his prized possession. You are his people honored and set apart. And see, listen, when we talk about this, this uh, prelude to worship that we've been talking about for the last couple Sundays, listen, when it comes to that prelude, we're not the backup orchestra. We're not the backup band. We're not, hey, if everything fails with this, you know, we're going to call our, our second string in. That's not who we are. We're not, and for those of you that know things about orchestras and stuff like that, listen, we're not second chair. We're not third chair. No, we have been handpicked by the conductor. We are to play this prelude and then to play the main theme of this great song going into eternity. That's the, this, this prelude that we're involved in right now in our worship it's only because he has made us privileged and honored in his kingdom through Christ. The second point is this, the perfect place. Our text then says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with, courts with praise. Now I want us to pay particular attention to two things particularly. One, the command to enter his gates. And two, and the command to enter his courts. How blessed the people of God were in those olden days. Now, we're going to go back over this a little bit deeper now. All could come into the city of Jerusalem, but only the people of God could pass through that uh, court of the Gentiles and then going into the women's court. And then it was only those who were ritually clean. See, this is a set apart area. This is a distinct area. Not everyone could come in here. But because the Jews were privileged people in the kingdom of God, they were honored in the kingdom of God, they could enter into that first court. Only the men, though, could go into that next area, the, the priest court, where the sacrifices were made, where the, where the brazen altar was, where the, where the lava for cleansing was, where the sacrifices were made. Only the men and the priest were found honored and privileged enough to go into that spot. But then, next, only the priest could enter into that temple proper, into the next court, that holy place, where we talk about you had the table of showbread and the, the, the candle, the menorah, and the, the altar of incense. And he could only go in there, and when he went in there, he replaced that, that showbread once a week onto, onto that table of showbread. And he would make sure that the oil lamps were always trimmed and always burning, and he would burn that incense for the Lord. Lastly, only the high priest once a year could enter that last court into that sanctum sanctorum, the holy of holies with the blood of the sacrifice on that day of atonement so that he could atone for the people's sins that were outside waiting. But why this place? Why that place? Why these people? Because they are his special people. They are called to enter his gates and his court. 
They have privileged access to this place. Remember, as, as they enter, they are coming as close as they can into the king's presence right now. That was as close as they could get to the living God. And yet they would come into his presence with singing. Remember, it's only by the king's grace and mercy that any, that any enter into his presence. Can you think of any better place for, for them to worship their God than in this place? It puzzles the mind, really, then how as time went on, how they could commit spiritual adultery and, and worship false gods like Baal and Ashtaroth and Moloch and Chemosh and, and worship in the, in the high places and even sacrifice their children to these false gods. How could they do this? How could they enter the gates and the courts of these other gods and commit those abominations and that spiritual adultery knowing who they were and to whom they belonged as the people of God? How could they do that? Now, something has changed in, in, two in almost 2,000 years. There on Calvary's Mount, something changed. The Son of God, beaten and bruised and bleeding, hung there on the cross in the dark afternoon sky. And when he cried out, it is finished, and died, bowed his head, the earth quaked, the rocks split open, the dead rose up. And hear this. The inner curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the, peop from the people. That thing that separated the people from their God, from the presence of God. That curtain is rent in two from the top to the bottom by God himself. That place where earlier the presence of God resided, God was now saying, you have access. forever undone and that by the blood of Christ we might enter into a perfect place in the act of worship. Turn back over to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. Therefore brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with the pure water. Do you see that? We can come into that place now. We who have been honored and privileged enough by the Lord to be called to salvation, have been enabled to enter into his very presence. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 4 and 14 through 16. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable, unable to sympathize with our weakness but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Listen, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Spurgeon said, into whatever court of the Lord you may enter, let your admission be the subject of praise. Thanks be to God, the innermost court is now open to believers, and we enter into that which is within the veil. It is incumbent upon us that we acknowledge the high privilege by our song. Now let me apply this in two different ways. First, Christians, listen, you are called to gather together in the act of worship. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Let me give you the ESV version first. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. The King James says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Listen, you're called to gather and worship as the body of Christ. 
And I hope you understand that because you're going to answer one day for all the times you just did this when it came to worship. Eh, what's a Sunday? You are commanded to gather together with the body of Christ in the act of worship. See, this gathering of ourselves together can be done anywhere, though. Anywhere the people of God come together in the act of worship, that time of, of going beyond the veil to that perfect place in the presence of God, well, that is the church. Barn, hillside, garage, house, cave, mountain, basement, all can be a place of worship, every one of those places, so long as they follow this New Testament model that we've been given, so long as the sacraments are performed, the Lord's Supper and baptism, as long as the Word of God is preached, the Scriptures are read, prayers are lifted up, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs are sung, and the Gospel is proclaimed. If all that's there, we have church. I can't tell you how many of the Puritans, back in the days when, when, the, when the Baptists were outlawed in some places, they'd go out and they'd find a field to go into. There was one point where I can't remember the pastor's name. Uh, he, wanted to, he, he went out into this field and all the miners came out of the mines. It's there in England somewhere. All of them poured out, hundreds of them. He preached to them right there in front of the mines. I think it was Jonathan Edwards stood on a rock in a field one time. How dare we not gather and worship when it's commanded? The second is that we can enter that place alone. We can go to this place alone. At times we may not be near the bo a body of Christ's uh, children. We might not be near a church or a body of believers. It may be that we're in the car on a long distance traveling uh, uh, expedition. Uh, we, we may be at the house doing our regular duties. We may be at work or on a treadmill or in the rush on a subway someplace. But listen, we can go beyond that veil, even there, and enter into the presence of our King and fall on bended knees and worship Him. We can do that. We've been given that ability by what Christ did on the cross. There are no hindrances to keep us from doing that except for ourselves. We keep ourselves from going into that place and worshiping. We are privileged we have access to the perfect place, the presence of God, to worship. Now that prelude to worship that we've been talking about, that prelude begins here and now, today, and every day until we go home to glory. That prelude has begun. begun. This is but a warm-up. We're just backstage right now before we take the stage for the main act in eternity. But we can enter that holy of holy place and be in the presence of the living God and worship Him even now. Lastly is this, the great purpose. Our text tells us why and to what purpose we are here. It says, enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise, giving thanks to Him and we bless His name. That's our purpose. People tell me, I don't know what I'm called to do in life. Worship the Lord God. Praise Him and give Him thanks. You want to know what you're... That's, that's a good place to start. Thomas Watson said, Praising God is one of the highest and purest acts of religion. In prayer, we act like men. In praise, we act like angels. John Boyce said, the servants of the Lord are to sing his praises in this life to the world's end. And in the next life, uh, and in the next life, world without end. Henry Law said, eternity will be too short to fully recount his praise. Let us not shorten our joy by neglecting to begin here on earth. Our praise of the triune God and our thankfulness for all He has done for us is what permeates every note, 
every beat and every word of this prelude to worship that we are engaged in right here and right now. Turn over to the, to the book of Psalms. We're uh, back to 100. So let's go to Psalm 146. <clears throat> Psalm 146. I noticed this as I, as I was studying. Y'all may go, that sounds kind of, kind of silly, you know. I mean, okay, big deal. But I found it interesting. When we look at Psalm 146, the last five books in all the Psalms, they're all about giving praise to the Lord. Look at Psalm 146. Verse 1, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. It starts out with praising Him. But look at the last verse. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Starts and begins with praising the, God, the Lord. 147, praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. Look at the last verse. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his rules. Praise the Lord. Again, starting and ending with praising the Lord. 148, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the, height, in the heights. The whole thing is about praise. All the way up to the last one. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints. For, for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. 149, praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praises in the assembly of the godly. The last verse, to execute on them the judgment written. This is honor for all the, his godly ones. Praise the Lord. Lord. 150, praise the Lord is the first thing you see. Praise the Lord is the last thing you see. It's important that we praise the Lord. And then when we stop and add to it, Psalm 136, right there at the very beginning, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of, the, of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. All the way through that, he's talking about everything that Israel had reason to give thanks for. The people of God had manifold reasons to praise and give thanks according to these six psalms. When we look and see what he had done for them. But one, listen, one greater than Moses has come. A priest who could fill all the requirements of the law stands before the Lord for us. A perfect final sacrifice has been made. One who would go uh, uh, one final time behind that veil and bring it down for the true people of God, one who would bring a greater salvation than the parting of the Red Sea, one who would defeat the enemy, sin, Satan, and death once and for all. Praise that one. Give thanks to him. And oh, he that is not just bread from heaven that gave physical life, but the one who is the bread of life, giving spiritual life. He that was not the waters of the well at Sychar, but he who was the living waters, the, the water of life. Praise him. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. There's a song that, that's been around for years. Blessed be the name of the Lord. For Christ Jesus has come. Christian, this is how you should be worshiping today. When you came through the door, and I've asked this for the last three Sundays now, when you came through that door this morning, what were you expecting to do? What was on your heart? What was on your mind? Was it worshiping the living God? Was it coming through those doors knowing that you are the privileged, honored people of God coming into His presence to worship? Did you understand when you were coming into this place this morning that you were going to go into the perfect place? Not this building, not this stuff, but as you came through these doors, that you were going to go into the perfect place, the presence of the living God? Listen, and I want you to hear me on this. We all do this in different ways. Some people are, are a little bit more quieter, a little bit more reserved. Some are louder and more animated. 
But between the different hearts involved in worship, there is a perfect harmony, a perfect tempo, a perfect tuning for all the glory of God and the praises and the thanks that are offered up at that time. I've said, now, I've said this now multiple times. We, of all people, should be leading the way for every creature on earth to see how to worship this one and only true God. Did you come this morning with that purpose? Did you come understanding who you were? Did you come seeking to worship in the perfect place in the presence of God? It was just by chance that I looked at the songs way back when and I went, looks good. And I kept on going and then, and then this morning when I finished up my sermon that I used this particular hymn that popped into my head. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him for He is your health and salvation. With joy and fear to God your Savior draw near. Praise Him and glad adoration. We are called to this prelude of worship here and now. Do we acknowledge it? Do we take it to heart? And do we seek to glorify the living God, and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, through a spirit that lives in us, that brings us to praise and give thanks as we are in his presence, the privileged and honored people of God. Father, we just ask that at this moment you would begin stirring in our hearts. And Father, as we begin to take the Lord's Supper, I just pray that we would all just find ourselves on our knees, seeking your face and seeking how to properly worship you. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.